Good morning, Vision. How are we doing today? All right. Uh, always a joy to be with you. I've, I've had the opportunity to share with you guys uh, m- many times in the past, and this is like just a, a place that we consider just a, a spiritual family uh, to us, and uh, always a joy to be with you. Love your pastor. I'm going to brag on him a little more as we get into the sermon today, but let's dive right into the reason we're here this morning, to the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them to Ezekiel chapter 33. If you would, Ezekiel chapter 33. And as you turn there, I'd like to pray for our time together in the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. It's life to us. As the Holy Spirit comes and speaks through the Word, I pray that our vision would just be focused straight on you, our ears, as it were, the spiritual ears the, uh, would be quick to hear what the Spirit says to the church, that our eyes would be open and that our hearts would be soft. Lord, we want to be those who are effective and fruitful for your kingdom in these last days in which we live. And so, Lord, exhort and encourage us today through your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 33, I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man... Speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet but not, did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself." But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked man from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how then can we live? And say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Amen? This is a heavy passage. There is no ifs, ands, and buts about it. We have come to a very heavy portion of Scripture. It's not a Scripture. I think many people would think, uh, if I'm going to guest speak at a church, I'm going to go straight to Ezekiel 33. But I believe that this is a message that the church desperately needs today. As I was thinking about this word, the famous events of April 14th, 1912 came to mind. When the unthinkable happened to the unsinkable, and of course I'm talking about the unsinkable ship, the Titanic, it sank to the bottom of the ocean after hitting an unforeseen iceberg, more than 1,500 lives were lost. For years, historians, scientists, engineers, and specialists have tried to piece together the facts of that fateful event that led to this catastrophe. In reality, There were many factors all woven together that could have changed the outcome. But two factors specifically struck me as I was doing some research into it. First, the Titanic received an iceberg warning from another ship. The radio operator considered the warning non-urgent, so did not deliver it in time to the appropriate uh, wheelhouse to take action. The second seemingly small detail was that there were no binoculars accessible to the crew. The key to the binocular case was never acquired before leaving 
the port. This means no one was carefully watching the waters for what might lie ahead. There are other many factors involved, but when I read those two, all of a sudden, this prayer came to my heart. God, may America's church not be like the Titanic, unprepared, unwatchful, and unwilling to heed the warning signs of the moral decay and spiritual dangers that are all around us. In large part, I believe the church in America finds itself today consuming some of the fruits of its many indifferences over the past hundred years or so. Progressive ideas that follow the philosophies of humanity, or as Paul calls them, the basic principles of the world and not Christ, have trickled into the church, planting one bad idea after another into our church cultures, into the way that we uh, how, pursue or view the word of God, or even into our worldview. And this has left us in a place, and I hate to say it, where a lot of bad, godless, worldly ideologies have infiltrated the church, and instead of the church being the watchman that is calling out the bad ideas of the world and calling people to righteousness and repentance, they have merely become places of propagation where the fruit of the world is growing up under the banner of Jesus and being spit out into a cancerous in, uh, making a cancerous environment for the church that causes the church to be ineffective and unfruitful for the kingdom in the culture in which we live. The church has abdicated to a large degree its voice and stewardship as what Paul said, the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The place where God's truth resonates and emanates from to a godless culture that is dying and facing the reality of God's judgment. But in many ways, the church has abdicated to the culture rather than speaking out and shining as a light against it. Certainly, the need that Jude felt in his spirit applies just as much today as it did back then when Jude wrote, I found it necessary exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. You know, we live, we just, uh, America just celebrated 248 years as a country of freedom. We live in a place where you are free to believe the things you want to believe and speak the things you want to speak and live with the consequences of those beliefs. But I believe for the Christian in America, there has to come a time where we draw the line in the sand and we stand up and say, enough is enough. Stop the indoctrination of our children. Stop force-feeding demonic ideas and doctrines. And we must call to the church, stop propagating these bad ideas in the name of Jesus. Preach the word. Stop introducing spiritually tantalizing ideas into doctrine that diminish the clear teaching of scriptures and tarnish the beauty of the gospel. Ezekiel was a prophet who seemed to understand the weight of the calling in which he received. In fact, you might make a note on the side of your Bibles there that Ezekiel 33 is a word-for-word reminder of a calling that Ezekiel received back in chapter 3 at the beginning of his ministry. Most agree that Ezekiel was about 30 years old when he received this call. Until that point in his life, he was born into a priestly caste among thousands. Part of his training was to... Uh, light candles in the tabernacle, breaking bread, blowing trumpets, arranging wood on the altar. But there came a point in his life where God was going to call Ezekiel out of the mundane religious tasks into something greater. And that call was to be the call of a watchman on the wall. The Lord effectively tells Ezekiel here, I'm giving you a job. Oh, and by the way, if you refuse the job, and harm comes to the people because of your refusal, I'm going to hold you accountable. What would you do if you were Ezekiel? Okay, Lord, what job exactly did you have in mind? The job description by the Lord is to watch and listen and warn. This job of a prophet and a watchman stemmed from this vision Ezekiel had of heaven and the glory of God, which even, I would imagine, receiving this call, Ezekiel was probably trembling fearful at the thought of what this would mean for him. 
But all of his fear of man was washed away by his vision of the glory of God. That's what he kept at the forefront of his mind. Ezekiel was called to be a watchman on the wall. In ancient times, it's, you know, city walls didn't have windows. The, the people living within the walls of a city had no way of knowing what was going on in the world outside of their city. And so watchmen would be hired, and the watchmen would come up onto the wall. Why? Because the top of the wall provided a place of perspective and a place of protection. The person on the wall could see the things happening beyond the city, the potential threats, the potential attacks, the potential wars that were going on around, and sound the alarm for the people inside to be prepared for the things that were coming. I want to say something that I believe is 100% true. It's, I'm going to say it unapologetically. I know it might seem like common knowledge, but in places I go sometimes it doesn't seem like a lot of people understand. That the true church of Jesus Christ are the watchmen that God has called in these last days. I believe that with all my heart. I agree with Spurgeon when he wrote this. The church is the watchman upon the walls of Zion, and to neglect her duty would be to endanger the cause of truth and weaken the hands of the feeble-minded. The church is called to be the watchman. And so as we look at Isaiah's call, I think we can apply certain principles, characteristics, if you were, of what a watchman does and apply these things to our own lives. So if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you four things that God says a watchman needs in order to effectively do their job. Number one, every watchman needs eyes that see. Every watchman needs eyes that see. We think of blindness as the inability to perceive or know the things that are going on around you. A watchman, part of his job was to be able to locate and spot the things happening outside. And, and for that purpose, you had to be keenly tuned in and aware of the things going on around you. My brother is an elite fisherman, deep sea fisherman. Every time I go out with him, I'm amazed because we'll be driving in the middle of the ocean and I'll just be like, oh, look at the dolphin and look at the waves and look at the clouds. And he'll be with his binoculars and he'll see some little the walls of the church and in the culture. Consider these few verses. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Timothy says, Be watchful in all things. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, Peter tells us, The end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 5 and 6, You are all sons of the light and of the day, not of the darkness or of the night. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Every Christian needs to have eyes that are willing to see beyond their own comfort, beyond their own lives, beyond their own ambitions, beyond their own dreams, beyond their, and to see what is God wanting to do around me? What is going on in my world and in my culture that I have been placed in my neighborhood in this time and in this place for such a time as this that God would say, I have called you. I have called you from darkness into light. I have prepared good works beforehand that you should walk in them. I have given you an eternal purpose that you will one day stand before Jesus and give an account for. And if you have the eyes to see, your life can be radically involved and used for eternal purposes that you can't even fathom or understand. But sadly, and this is not a, a condemnation or an accusation of you. For all of us, it is such an easy temptation that the only thing I'm willing to see are the things that only relate to me, that are only in the bubble of my own purview, rather than getting above it all. God, what are you calling me to do to affect your kingdom in such a time as this? I think there are several things that we're called to see. Number one, we need to see the state of our churches. Paul warns us in Acts chapter 20 that 
From among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things and draw away disciples after themselves. There are false teachers everywhere in the church. And I, I tell you, I don't know if you've, if you've struggled with this or you've noticed, but like in, in the YouTube, Instagram, social media age, um, you're going to be bombarded with little clips and little voices of all these self-proclaimed prophets and apostles and pastors who are planting seeds of really potentially bad and unbiblical ideas in a lot of people's minds and hearts. Um, I, I, again, I don't, I know that he, he doesn't want this, but I'm just, I just have to encourage you as a church, like, do you, do you understand the blessing of having a pastor that teaches the Bible? I, I mean, you have to understand, I think it does deserve an applause, not, not because as pastors we need or, or desire or, or, or should even receive any sort of praise, but I'm telling you, if you take a tour of American churches today, you might be emotionally moved by the pastor. You might, be, uh, you, you might feel really inspired. But the, the, when the rubber meets the road, it is the content that is from the word of God that matters the most into being planted into your heart. And, and your pastor faithfully preaches God's word week in and week out. And part of being able to see is to have a clear view of what God's word says. There's a lot of progressivism in the church today, and I love C.S. Lewis's uh, quote regarding being progressive. He said, we all want progress, but progress means getting nearer to the place where you want to be. And if you've taken a wrong turn and then go forward, it does not get you any nearer. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking on the right road and in that case, the man who turns the back of the soonest is the most progressive. What we need today is to turn back to God's word in our lives as the guiding truth and the source of all wisdom, guidance, and life for us. The, the next thing we need to see is the state of our culture. And we can get into hot water here, but the reality is Ezekiel's ministry as a watchman wasn't glamorous. It often came at personal sacrifice. But his call was to be aware of culturally what was going on in Israel and outside of Israel, to call a warning, to bring God's clarity to issues that people were confused about. Is this right? Is this wrong? Now, while I pray that unlike Ezekiel, none of us have to lay on our side for a year or cook food over human dung, that's gross, but it's true. That's what he had to do to illustrate some of God's principles the greater point here is that Ezekiel often had to do challenging, uncomfortable things to confront the societal and spiritual ills in the culture around him. When God exposed something to Ezekiel, he was called to give the warning. And likewise, when cultural sins and unrighteousness keeps people blinded to their sin, hardens their hearts, sears their consciences to the things of God, it is the Christian. It is the church that is to declare the difference between good and evil and light and dark and sweet and bitter. For Isaiah the prophet says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. When everyone around us is mixing up the definitions of what is right and good and righteous and moral, it is not the world that is going to autocorrect. It is the church that stands up as a light and the salt in the world and says, no, that is not what God declares as right and good. It is that light, that salt, that brings the conviction of sin when it is much needed. So we must see the state of the church. We must see the state of the culture. Also, the Bible tells us here we need to see the reality of God's justice. Do you know that God is a just God? In fact, Ezekiel is told, when you see God's sword upon the land, in other words, when you see God's judgment looming over a nation, over a people, it is your job to warn them about that coming judgment. Well, how does this apply to the church? There's a story in Acts chapter 17, you might jot it down, where Paul is preaching to the philosophers of the day on Mars Hill, the Areopagus. And he spoke about the idolatrous practices of the people. 
Listen to what he says in Acts chapter 17, verses 29 through 31. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature like gold or silver or stone, something that's shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but he now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of all this by raising him from the dead. And in short, if I could sum that up, Paul is telling the people, the unsaved culture around him, man is not, uh, God is not created in the image of man like an idol. Man is created in the image of God. And God has clearly revealed himself in the person of Jesus. But people have strayed from God and lived according to the dictates of their own heart and are in re- rebellion against God through their sin and through the things they think and do against God. And God, notice he says, commands everyone everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day by which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man Christ Jesus. Who else has that message to proclaim to a a, a, a a culture of people that will one day stand before their creator and give an account for their lives and what they did with Christ? Only you, only I. The church has to be the voice that warns the culture that God is not simply just the God of love who just accepts everyone where they are at and, and just will let anything slide because he's so loving redefining the love of God, but God is a God of love who demonstrated his love by while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, but he is coming again to judge the world, and there will be an eternal judgment for those who reject the way, the truth, and the life, the path of forgiveness, and God's offer for salvation, because God is coming once again as a judge. And I tell this uh, to our church frequently, and I think it's a, a good warning we need to heed, Your sin has to be judged. Every person's sin has to be judged because God is holy. He is righteous. But you and I, God has given us a choice. Do you want your sin to be judged on the cross of Jesus where he hung and died and took the wrath of God for you? Or do you want your sin to be judged on your own shoulders the day that you stand before your creator? Every person has that choice placed before them. Well, how are they going to find out? How are they going to know? Because the watchman on the wall sees the reality. And this leads me to my second point. Not only does a watchman need the eyes to see, a watchman, number two, needs the courage to sound. The courage to sound. Verse three. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning If the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. If he heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, the sword comes and takes any person from among them, his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Think about that weight. If you see the judgment of God, if you see things happening around you and you see them, but you're not willing to sound the alarm and people don't hear and they're judged, but they're judged in their ignorance, the watchman is held responsible for not sounding the alarm when God asked him to. That is a challenging and convicting thought. Once a man visited the the famous preacher Dwight Moody And he said, man, I want to be a winner of souls just like you. Moody told the man, go look out the window and tell me what you see. And he said, I I see a street filled with traffic and pedestrians. Moody said, no, look again and tell me what you see. He looked a second time and he replied, well, I, I see people, men and women and boys and girls about their daily business. Finally, Moody himself walked to the window, and with tears in his eyes, he said, I see people going to hell if they don't know Jesus, and until you see people like that, you will never lead them to Christ. This is what it means to be on the wall, to have not only the eyes that see, 
but the voice that is willing to sound the trumpet. I've processed why, looking in the mirror, my own heart, why Christians tend to sometimes make excuses about not getting involved, not speaking out in certain cultural battles or on certain controversial issues that are issues of righteousness and unrighteousness, life and death, eternal judgment, and make all sorts of excuses as to why, you know, we don't want to ruffle feathers and we don't want to get involved in those issues. And I figured that it can only be three, one of three reasons. Either number one, perhaps it's because of ignorance or uncertainty. If people see something and they don't know if it's a threat or not, they don't want to like blow the trumpet accidentally, that's legitimate. But if that's the case, then knowledge and instruction should remedy that. If you're uncertain about if something's right or wrong or needs to be spoken about or sounded, the alarm sounded, then when you learn what God says, that should fix that issue. Number two, perhaps the watchman doesn't understand their role. They see the signs of what's going on, but they think, well, someone else will do it. That's not really my place. Well, that should be remedied simply by teaching them that their responsibility is to be a watchman on the wall. But finally, and sadly, I believe this is usually the case. What I find to be the case most of the time is it simply is that the watchman is a coward. He doesn't want to blow the trumpet because it might expose him to the enemy. If the enemy sees a guy on the wall blowing the trumpet, who's going to be the first target? The guy blowing the trumpet. And so he buries his head. He pretends like he doesn't see. He goes and hides in the corner because maybe the whole battle will pass and at least I will come out unscathed. That's what many churches, many Christians do today. They make excuses as to why we can't speak too clearly on the issues. We have to kind of be in the middle, but really it's out of self-protection. They don't want someone to sue them. They don't want the government to come against them. They don't want to be persecuted. Even though the Bible says all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. God looks at the church as a watchman and he says, I will hold you churches accountable for the ignorance in your community, for the unreached, for those who will continue in their sin because there was no voice that warned them or gave them a better way. Now, we know that simply putting a warning out there doesn't ensure that people will listen. In fact, the Bible says most people will turn from the truth, and Jesus said that the darkness hates the light and will flee from it, and that's usually the case. But Jesus also said You shall know the truth, and the what? The truth shall make you. It's not compromise that makes people free. It's the truth. I'm currently uh, in the middle of a lawsuit. I'm being sued by um, a local pastor in our community who's, he and his husband pastor this church downtown in our community, and uh, He was on the library board, and I basically said, I don't think he should be appointed to the library board. We don't want drag queen shows in our library. It's very kind, very respectful. Uh, He's currently suing our church. He's, uh, should I say, me personally, asking for the the exemption or the 501c3 exemption of our church to be taken away, all these sorts of things that's going on. And so I'm getting, I'm just getting, you can get blasted by on, on social media, and all these things are being said about me. I'm, I'm learning new things about myself every day. It's like, oh, wow. Didn't realize I said that. That's really interesting. But one of the, one of the many comp- uh, comments that got me thinking, one person on Facebook wrote, as a non-religious person, this makes me never want to step foot in a church ever again. And I had someone say, did you see that comment, Josh? I mean, isn't, isn't our job is to want to get people in the world to come into the church? I, I thought the goal was to get people in the door, not to push people away. And I would emphatically say the goal is not to get people in the doors of the church. The goal is to get people to Jesus. What are you going to do if you compromise truth to get sinners in church? Then you, might, then you have to continue to compromise your message to get them to stay. What they need is the truth in love. 
And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. The way we speak the truth and the way we is, uh, uh, engage the culture is very important. Don't hear me otherwise, but let's get there in a moment if I have time. Oh, my. Okay. So a watchman needs eyes to see. A watchman needs uh, the courage to sound and a voice to speak. I think of Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We want to be the clarion call that cuts through the confusion and brings much needed truth. But this leads me to my final point, and that is a watchman needs a desire to save. Eyes to see, courage to sound, voice to speak, and and a heart to save, a desire to save. Notice the very end of the passage, verse 10. Therefore, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? And say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? And here, notice, the people of Israel hear Ezekiel's calling, and their response is, What's, what hope do we have? If we're dead in our sins and we're pining away in our sins, we're just going to die. How can we live? And God responds. And what does God respond? That's not what I want. I don't want you to die in your sin. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that you would turn from your ways and live. That is God's heart. That is God's desire. I'm reminded of the story in Luke chapter 9 when Jesus goes to a village of the Samaritans, but they did not receive him. And in verse 54, we read that when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Right, good old James and John's, the sons of thunder. Jesus, you want us to call down fire from heaven to judge these wicked sinners since they rejected you? And Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them. And here's a very important statement to balance the, the things that I've said up to this point. And that is that as a church, as Christians... We cannot allow our disillusionment with the world to cause us to lose sight of our mission as the church. We do not see and sound and speak in order to destroy people's lives, but in order to save their lives. Amen? Jesus said of himself, the Son of Man has, not come, to, has come to seek and save that which was lost. Hey, if you're someone in the world who celebrates unrighteousness, who celebrates wickedness, you need to understand that God will not be mocked. His judgment will come against all unrighteousness and against all sin. But on the other end of that, if you are a person who declares God's righteousness and God's holiness and speaks out against sin, but ultimately you don't care or love the people that God wants to save, then you too are the one in sin. I am the one in sin. If our motive is simply to tell the truth, but not to see the truth set people free. If a Christian's heart is ever filled with hate, it must be hate for sin and for the devil who is the great deceiver. If God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, certainly we should take no pleasure in their destruction either. And I've noticed that there are some in the church who want to fight simply because they like to fight and they want to destroy their opponents. They're fighting for the right things, but fighting in the wrong way and with the wrong motive. Notice Paul's instruction to Timothy, a young pastor, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance that they might come to know the truth, 
that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. In the fight, and that's what it is, we are all in a battle. If you're, if you're in here, I don't want to be in a battle. Too bad, you already are in one. It's not a matter of if you want to be in a battle or not. We need to maintain our strength, our courage, and our resolve against sin and unrighteousness, knowing that those are the very things that are bringing about the judgment of God upon people. But we also do it while hoping to rescue as many out of his grip because of the love of God for the world. That God sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is our hope and our heart. We fight so that we might see people come to the knowledge of Christ. How selfish is it of us if we have such a great treasure in this earthen vessel for us to hide it under a basket, to hide the lamp under a basket, to keep the greatest gift that has ever been demonstrated and given to mankind to ourselves. The watchman, the reason, the whole reason he watches and the whole reason he sounds and the whole reason he warns is that the people might be saved. And may that be our heart as Christians. To see those in our culture understand there is a God who in their sin saw them and was not content to leave us alone to face his rightful judgment, but instead he came on a rescue mission of love. He became one of us. He walked in our shoes. He lived without sin so that all those sinners who are distant from him could choose to repent, to turn towards him and receive the free gift of his grace and his love and his forgiveness and his acceptance. And I just want to call out to you, if you're here this morning because you were invited to church, maybe you're here this morning, you're thinking, man, I don't know what this is all about, but there's something missing in my heart. There's, there's this, this desire that I know I, I probably need God in my life. God is calling you. He's drawing you. He's inviting you to take a step of faith to find his forgiveness, to find his gift of eternal life in your own heart. What do I have to do, Josh? The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. If you come to the recognition that I can't make my own way to God, that I have failed in my thoughts and in my speech and in my motives and in my heart. I've failed God's perfect standards. If you can acknowledge that before God, there is a gift of salvation that is free to you for the taking if you would place your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross for your sins. But as we close our time together in the word today, May we all be reminded that God is still calling watchmen. Not just individual pastors or people, though there are some calling to do that, but his church. Every person that has chosen to follow Jesus, who is full of the Spirit, who carries the gospel in their life, God has called you as a watchman on the wall to see, to sound, to speak, and to save. And may that be a calling that we consider with great humility and weight this morning as we approach the communion table. May we ask the Lord for a fresh filling of his Holy Spirit to equip us with courage and boldness to be the light and the salt that's so desperately needed in our world today. If you would pray with me.